All right, welcome back everybody. We are on day three of four, halfway through our wonderful virtual AI event. We're so excited to dive into more AI information today. Stay tuned for a lot of really great panels and information coming your way. This morning for our key keynote, we have two Steves, Steve Sundrum and Steve Oren here. We're gonna start with Steve, Steve Sundrum. Over to you, Steve, good luck. Thank you, Hannah, and good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure and honor to spend some time with you. I've gained a lot of uh, value and insight from the reverse pitch. I think it's a novel and interesting format. And um, I, you know, I think it's interesting as we start to shift the reverse pitch from uh, the challenges to the solutions. Um, uh, my role is as a solution provider, and I hope to provide a a point of view that adds something to the conversation here today. Uh, so as Hannah mentioned, I'm Steve Sundstrom. I'm Group Vice President of the uh, Utility Segment for C3 AI. And um, we are based in the uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and what I'd like to do is just do a brief introduction of who we are to help you understand uh, kind of where our point of view is coming from. Uh, I'll focus in on, I think, uh, four of the larger challenges that we see when we engage with our clients. Uh, I'd like to follow that with some solutions to address uh, some of those challenges. As uh, Neil said during the keynote, I admire how EPRI's role is to help connect solutions to challenges, so we'll try and follow suit. And then um, there are plenty of examples of, um, of, of uh, successful AI deployments, so I wanna just uh, finish with a few of those that we see. So first, just a little bit about C3 AI. We are an enterprise software company. We're in Silicon Valley. We're about 500 employees growing strong. We just went public uh, back in December or we're traded under the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol AI if you're interested in learning more about who we are. But um, we are focused on this idea of enterprises of all industries um, leveraging artificial intelligence and data science to improve their business performance. And um, if, you, if you look at what's gone on with S&P 500 companies in the last uh, 20, 30 years, if you don't transform, you, you die, right? You get, you merge, you go out of business. Uh, and, and we only see this trend accelerating. The cycle, business cycles are trans, uh, transpiring so quickly that companies always need to be innovating. And I think the innovation arena uh, of today is applying artificial intelligence. So this is the problem that we're focused on. And we see plenty of dy dynamics within the utilities industry that everyone has been talking about the last couple of days that, that uh, present these, these uh, challenges to, to us organizationally. And I thought I would just share this um, insight from Gartner uh, to show how AI is emerging so quickly uh, for CIOs and leaders of, of um, industry. In just 2018, a small 7% thought AI was uh, very important or a top concern. And a year later, it was 40% and it continues to grow. Uh, and if you look at like the overall business value that is forecast to be realized from the implementation of AI across all industries, we're talking in the trillions of dollars and growing very quickly. So we are honored to, to serve uh, a number of uh, the iconic global brands. Uh, it's, it's our honor to, to serve some of these brands, ac again, across all industries. We tend to be focused on leaders of each industry category, so 3M and Shell and Department of Defense and Bank of America, Philips and the like. But we've actually been spending a lot of time with leading utilities as well. So again, it's our honor to, to spend time and provide solutions and have been selected by AEP and Duke Energy, Con Edison, Eversource, uh, SunPower, New York Power Authority, Across the Ocean, NL, NG, and the like. Uh, this, is, this is our idea of a, of a really good time. Uh, we've been identified by Forrester as a leader in this category of providing industrial scale time series and AI uh, software solutions and platform. Uh, so, um, so this is what we've been working on the last decade. And 
we work with our clients to um, deploy these uh, operationalized AI solutions. And right now, today, uh, we are, our, our system is responsible for about 1.1 billion predictions per day. About, uh, that's, that's being derived from about 4.8 million machine learning models. Uh, that's taking time series data from 622 million time series sensors. Um, and then we are interconnected with um, any number of uh, uh, source systems. So, um, so, so this is what we're doing day in and day out right now. And as it relates to the utilities industry, I just wanted to make a quick comment that uh, our CEO has just joined the Gridwise Alliance uh, Council that will be advising the administration on where best to invest uh, the infrastructure budget to improve grid resiliency and modernize the grid. It's our pleasure to be serving on that. So let me shift a little bit to some of the challenges that um, we have been talking about the last couple of years, but from our point of view, uh, this, these are what becomes top of mind. You know, operationalizing AI is critical and it's really hard. Uh, and we're coming from the last couple of decades where the game was to aggregate data into a data warehouse. Maybe this is a tens of megabytes, uh, and then perform analysis and produce the results of this analysis in some kind of a report, a BI tool. Uh, the game is significantly shifted here when you are talking about operationalizing AI. Significantly greater data, a higher variety of data, significantly more time series data, uh, developing, maintaining, and implementing and operating machine learning models, which you need to evolve over time, and tending to uh, integrations, not only among data sources, but among services that make all of this possible. And let me just comment very quickly about what we mean by operationalizing AI. Uh, what that means to us is uh, building an AI ML model, deploying it in your operations so that the model is observing uh, data as it is changing in real or near real time, and then generating predictive insights that provide actions for your employees or your customers to act on. Uh, so this is what we mean by operationalized AI. And again, that's in contrast to the idea of um, hunting and pecking and con conducting rear view analysis that produces a report or maybe a dashboard. So what we're observing right now is a disconnect between the environments in which data scientists and business analysts are prototyping and developing AI and ML models in specialty tools. And these tools tend to be disconnected from the production systems where you would actually run the machine learning models in operations. Number two, we've talked about this a lot. Neil, during his keynote, referred to it as TMI, not the Three Mile Island, but the too much information. There is a deluge of data that is available from across the utility value chain. There's about a trillion dollar, two trillion dollar investment globally uh, in this decade to implement sensors across this value chain from generation sensors, transmission and smart substations, AMI meters, and even in the home behind the meter smart, uh, smart home technology. So there is a plentiful amount of uh, data, not only from the censoring of the network, but the data that is available in the underlying applications that utilities use day in and day out to run their business. OMS systems, DMS systems, customer systems, SCADA, Pi data, right? These are uh, highly valuable, uh, highly entrenched systems that do a good job of operating the utility, but the data within these systems are not really available within those systems for transacting, for analyzing in real time. There's a performance hit against that system, which they're not built for. These systems also tend to be very silo oriented. Systems in transmission don't necessarily talk to systems in generation or distribution but the data that are in these systems are valuable to solve problems that span the value chain. 
what we see evolving is a new layer of nimble, modern, operationalized AI applications that will ride kind of above the underlying enterprise data systems, will ride above the source uh, sensor data systems. And the challenge here is to accumulate these data, analyze these in near real time, and provide these uh, insights to employees and customers in a modern, clean, actionable interface on a mobile device, on a web, um, on a web page, and the like, or, or alerts. Number three challenge. You know, there's a lot of discussion in AI, uh, you know, about the idea of data science and AI and ML models. All of this is really software code. But, and, and if you think about the idea of deploying an application to your employees, uh, your engineers, to augment their business, to help them make the best decision in the moment as things are changing, uh, you're, you're talking about delivering software code in the form of an application. Within that application, it turns out that the ML code is relatively small. It's only about 5%. Now, it's invaluable and it's critical and there's a, there's a whole science around how you build ML models. But as far as the amount of code required, it's relatively small. Uh, and what's really important in this idea of developing and delivering ML insights that are actionable it is a much broader life cycle that we're talking about. Everything back to data uh, operations, data governance, data management, exploration, model development, which is an iterative cycle. Then you deploy the model in operations. And then you have, because of the nature of machine learning, this model needs to adapt and change to changing conditions. So again, you have this uh, cycle of um, continuous improvement around model operations, model maintenance, model governance, and ultimately uh, the production of these insights out to, to the end producer. So there's a, there's a broader conversation that needs to go on in addition to just what's the best model to solve this problem. Uh, and on that note, we really want to be able to take advantage of all the great innovation that is available from academia and industry and that are being made available in open source forums. So there are a number of tools and models that are available, and we want to be able to leverage this. This will accelerate model development, model deployment, and insight production. So I really just wanted to focus on the idea of the AI lifecycle ma uh, management. It starts with scaling petabytes worth of data. It also involves scaling a team of uh, professionals who are trained in data and, and ML development, uh, scaling the model management themselves. What we identify with a lot of these large companies is that we're not talking just about five, six, seven AI use cases. We're talking about hundreds of business use cases that can benefit from AI models. This is a high volume challenge. Uh, so it's scaling the code, maintaining the code, and uh, of course, scaling security. And I look forward to my colleague Steve's presentation after mine this morning to touch on that as well. So number four, final challenge here is because of the first three, what we see is a lot of enterprises are absolutely investing in skill sets and tools and capabilities around uh, ML and AI development, a lot of early prototyping and R&D going on. And there's a lot of successful, successful examples in this category. But uh, then, to take those models and those prototypes into production is a challenge. We see a few of these models making their way to production uh, kind of at limited scale, but really to, to bring them into full scale production, operationalized, evaluating time series uh, and being maintained is a really large step. And so this is one of the biggest challenges. How do you take this innovation and get it into the business? McKinsey calls this the AI activation gap, where there are any number of uh, initiatives that are launched to take advantage of AI, but as far as those that actually make it into sustained production and add value, there's about a six inch uh, activation gap. Uh, customers are having trouble handling data volumes and complexity. There's complexity in the tools and skill sets required. There's difficulty in deploying and managing the models in production. 
and um, companies are challenged in producing AI models that, that pr provide insights in real time. Okay, so I think a lot of these challenges um, have been discussed and are familiar. I just want to recap on those, but let me, there is good news. There's help on the horizon. Let me talk about a few solutions that are available. One is this idea of model-driven architectures. This idea brings organization and um, uh, cohesiveness to, to the conversation. And fundamentally, I won't go through the details here, but the idea is here, you, you have data coming in from the left uh, from any number of sources, the OSI Pi, SCADA systems, OMS, DMS, customer systems, weather, social media, a lot of variety, a lot of velocity, and a lot of volume, right? Uh, it comes into the uh, idea of an analytics platform that is in the middle. There's a lot of data governance, data management, data catalog, security, uh, operations capabilities. Uh, there's an integrated, embedded AI, ML capabilities. And, and the, the result of this coordination are these idea of AI models that can be uh, deployed in production, providing these uh, insights. Now, what we see going on in the market is uh, a lot of um, IT and data science organizations are going out into the market to go evaluate and identify uh, uh, AI ML solutions. And uh, here's what you see when you go out into the market. You see a lot of very compelling and, and probably familiar name brands out there. And it's confusing because when you go on the websites of a lot of uh, companies, uh, you see a lot of claims around, hey, we are an AI platform for your company. Uh, you know, select us and start using our tool. But I want to reemphasize what I described earlier about the broader life cycle, everything from data ingestion, data management, model development, model deployment, and model operations, all in an end-to-end -end capability. What we observe is that a lot of these are just pieces of that entire life cycle um, capability. So for Cassandra, I mean, you might go on the website and would say, well, you're, 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 we're an AI platform for you. But it's really an excellent technology for managing time series data, stronger than Hadoop, and that's where that came from. Uh, TensorFlow, is this an end-to-end -end capability? It's not. It's actually a wonderful open source library available from Google that provides a set of um, ML libraries that are available to help accelerate projects. Databricks, uh, disconnected virtual application development, but, but again, not end-to-end. -end. These are component pieces. Uh, Azure, AWS, Google has tools around ML development, but again, pieces of the puzzle. And so what happens is a lot of uh, IT organizations go out and start stringing these uh, different technologies together to solve use case number one and use case number two. Maybe one of them is a grid asset management. Another one is customer segmentation and targeting. Uh, and so after about five, six, use case number seven, this becomes a highly intractable problem. Uh, the interconnections among all of these tools and technologies uh, becomes very problematic. Uh, these uh, companies that produce these tools and technologies are doing so at their own pace, under their own development standards, and disconnected from the rest of the ecosystem. So companies who go in and try and start stringing all of this together, uh, you basically become uh, a, a, a systems integration company, and that needs to be a core uh, IT capability. Uh, but it becomes very time consuming. And if any one component breaks, then any use case associated with that component is dead in the water until it can be addressed. So this intractability is, 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 is a huge problem. So what needs to happen and the way this model-driven architecture adds value is it, 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 it starts to manage the interrelationships of all of these tools and technologies in a cohesive, coordinated way. And when done correctly, it actually enables enterprises to future-proof themselves from being over-reliant on, say, an open source technology, which is highly valuable, but uh, might change. And uh, might be a great solution today, but in seven, eight years, uh, might be eclipsed by something else. I mean, we've already seen the value of Hadoop. It was kind of a hot topic about a decade ago. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot less discussion about Hadoop right now. It still can be a valuable element, but there's other technologies that are coming to the forefront um, that uh, companies are going to want to integrate. And another characteristic of uh, this model-driven idea is that you might, um, you, you want to deploy in kind of a multi-cloud and on-prem hybrid arrangement. Uh, conversations about three or four years ago that I, were, I was having 
uh, IT leaders were like, well, we're aligned with uh, cloud provider X or Y, right? Uh, and we're going to do our best to kind of uh, go down that path. But now the conversations I hear are, well, that's a great idea. I wish we could do it, but we are we are going to be in a multi-cloud and on-prem combo environment. So you want something that can manage the complexity of the uh, deployment areas. And so how does this really manifest itself, this idea of this model-driven architecture? What I'm showing you right now is actual software code that um, – uh, is um, that, that produces the same end result. This is an, an, an AI application that has a predictive model to identify failures of an asset. And there's two ways to approach this. One is a traditional kind of SQL uh, structured language approach, and the other on the right is more of a model-driven approach. The model-driven approach radically simplifies what it takes to actually produce these kinds of ML artifacts. On the case on the left, it took about 83,000 lines of code, and in a model-driven environment, it only took about 1,450 lines of code. So uh, a lot less coding, speeds up deployment of models into production a lot faster, and then clearly maintaining these uh, lines of code over time is much easier in a, in a more model-driven architecture. Number two solution. Uh, thankfully, some no-code AI tools. The state of the art in a lot of data science right now is, is native code development, uh, R, Python, and Jupyter Notebook. It takes highly trained, highly skilled data scientists. But what we need to do is lower the bar uh, and make uh, data science and model development much easier. And so there's a category of uh, low-code, no-code development tools. So, so the dynamic is that uh, we are turning to data scientists to address these challenges. They're highly trained, they're highly expensive. There aren't that many of them yet, though that's changing. But as was mentioned in the panel yesterday, they're very hard to attract. So what we also see is companies are, are engaging business analysts, a kind of a different class of, a, of, of business analysts where there are much more. Uh, they're, they're trained, uh, they're frontline experts, they tend to be business minded, uh, but they are not pure data scientists who can code in uh, Python or R necessarily. And what we see, and I think we saw this on a panel from one of the IOSU yesterday, there was a data science paired with a technical lead uh, that was a liaison around the, the business. Uh, and so it's the combination of business analysts and data science uh, that, that really optimizes the skill sets and accelerates this whole problem. Uh, and what, so what we need to see here is we need to see a set of um, development environments that can address the, the skill sets of each of these class of, of professionals and need to do it in an interconnected, uh, coordinated way. So for instance, a, a, a business analyst might start building a model in a no-code environment, uh, and then uh, in collaboration with a data scientist, uh, may be working in a more robust uh, Jupyter notebook. So you need to coordinate you know, uh, how these environments interact with each other to in, enforce um, teamwork. Okay, and then the final solution set is really more about the soft skills. This is around skills development and coordination of AI ML efforts at large enterprises. And this idea of AI centers of excellence. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of activity, a, a lot of attention going on, but uh, that can be a challenge in, of, of its own self. So what can a, a functional center of excellence help with? Starting on the left, business value and alignment. What are the most interesting, most valuable uh, opportunities to apply AI ML. But number two, they need to be tractable as well. Uh, what's the AI addressability of this problem? And the first thing you tend to look at in that regard is, do I have availability of data to, to solve this problem and to build a reliable model with uh, sufficient precision and recall? Next would be ease of implementation, uh, people availability, and then what is the projected time to value to get this deployed? So what we observe in successful AI projects is, A, the, um, the problem is tractable. We're not trying to boil the ocean. It's not a moonshot to start. Uh, let, let's start with uh, some easy wins. Number two, let's qualify the data early. Do we have access to the data, sufficient history, sufficient failure modes, and the like to build a model? Uh, let's uh, pause. Let's uh, take a moment for evaluating uh, ethically the, the, what we're trying to accomplish here. And then very importantly, if we build this successfully and we deploy this in operations, what kind of business value and benefit can we project? And that really needs to be the true north in the deployment of enterprise AI and ML. So 
Uh, the governance around the center of excellence really drives consistent, scalable methods. It establishes technology standards, provides expert advice and skills development, uh, and um, you know trains trains skills over time. Uh, some of the key activities again are identify the pipeline of demand from the line of business, uh, define standards, deploy and maintain the development environments, train and mentor skills, uh, provide uh, guidance uh, around technology. Uh, create implementation modes and methods, uh, develop um, uh, using a standard set of tools, and then testing for the results and the outcomes of the deployed models. And so one of the artifacts from a center of excellence might look something like this. Over the next six quarters, which applications are we going to develop, which are identified in blue, uh, and to be deployed in operations, which are identified in gray? So uh, for instance, in this example, in the first half of 2020, it took about six months to develop and deploy an AI-based inventory optimization application. Uh, once the six months of development period is, is uh, done, the model is in business production and creating value. Uh, so then the next half, the team can start working on use cases number two and three, and so on and so forth. The idea here is that this investment uh, and development and deployment of these um, models is uh, showing, uh, is, is generating value and paying for itself over time. So let me just finish with a couple of really uh, good success stories at large scale. One is a project we happen to be involved with at NG, where we're um, um, uh, deployed a model to evaluate the health of 2,500 wind turbines. We developed 25,000 active machine learning models. Uh, and we're taking data from 20, 200,000 different sensors, and we're making 3.5 million predictions per day. Most of those predictions are fine. They're predictions that, hey, this, this, this asset is going to continue to work well. But a few of those predictions are going to pop up and say, hey, attention is needed. And one of the interesting things about this deployment is uh, we score uh, an overall health score that's dynamically updated every day, uh, if not sub-day, for the entire turbine, right? But we also apply ML models to evaluate the health of the key critical subcondition subsystems within that. So main bearing failure, gearbox overheating, ice on the blades, or underperformance relative to the turbines in the rest of the field. Uh, Duke Energy, stay tuned later today in the reverse pitch session this afternoon in asset management. Kevin Thompson from Duke Energy is going to talk about how they are leveraging physics-based analysis as feature inputs into new machine learning models that provide dynamic health scores for their up to 10,000 transformers and up to 22,000 circuit breakers. So that's in a session later today uh, with Duke Energy, a very innovative uh, approach. Over at Con Edison in New York, I just wanted to identify, you know, they are uh, building an enterprise data analytics platform. Uh, and over the past three years, they started small, but have been growing ever since. And today they're uh, integrating data from almost 30 different data sources, all into a single enterprise analytics platform, leveraging a core set of six applications to serve the use cases of uh, six business units. There are about 30 operationalized uh, analytic models running today and growing uh, every quarter. Uh, there's an exciting new category around uh, image analysis, whether it's uh, public safety and identifying objects uh, in, in the field around the substation, uh, worker safety and maybe constrained or dangerous uh, scenarios, uh, an area that I'm interested in around diagram parsing uh, to support digital twins in a more dynamic way, and then damage classification using imagery from satellites. And here's an artifact of, uh, of, of a COE that I just wanted to show. This is NG's. Um, uh, artifact of uh, the set of applications they've developed and deployed and have been putting in production and again uh, creating this virtuous cycle of getting value from the applications as we go. Okay, the final thing I would say is if you're interested in learning more, I would highly recommend a book that was just released by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Nikhil Krishnan, called Enterprise AI and Machine Learning for Managers. Uh, this is available uh, on Amazon and an excellent resource for people who are leading uh, AI uh, enterprise uh, ML initiatives. And the final thing I wanted to say is that the C3 Digital Transformation Institute will be running a series of uh, workshops 
uh, starting on June 4th, coming right up here in June. And the, the label of the workshops is Machine Learning for Resilient, Secure, Carbon-Free Electricity Supply. Uh, and so you can see the organizers. This is a highly academic oriented. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning more or participating in these workshops, you can go to c3dti.ai. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you again for your time. I hope that I uh, added a perspective that was helpful. And uh, looking forward to the next session from Steve. Hannah, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. That was wonderful. OK, um, we're going to head over to Steve Oren. And then afterwards, we will take a few questions um, from the audience. So make sure you post your questions in the Q&A. OK, Steve Oren, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, great to be here this morning. Um, thank you, Steve, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is about some of the infrastructure challenges to successful AI. And in my role as the federal CTO for Intel uh, Corporation, we've been helping government agencies look at the data problem and look at these uh, evolution towards AI and machine learning for many years. Part of the uh, unique opportunity we have is that underneath all of that data infrastructure, underneath that storage, underneath that model development, it's running on Intel processors. And so we get the new unique view holistically from start to finish about how organizations are looking to adopt AI, adopt machine learning, and take advantage of these business opportunities. So what I'm gonna highlight today is what we're seeing in the industry and in public sector where I live some of the key challenges to getting to AI. And as Steve mentioned earlier in his talk, the, the, the model or the actual AI itself is a small part of a much bigger challenge and a much bigger set of operations and solutions. But I'm, the, the point of today isn't just to tell you about all the bad challenges that we have and how we need to successfully get there. I wanna leave you with a, a, a reverse pitch. One area that isn't getting the highlight it needs, and that is I wanna talk about how do we get AI to help us secure our critical infrastructure, our energy, and our power grids. And to do that, we need to be able to uh, tackle these infrastructure challenges for cybersecurity in the critical infrastructure. So with that, let's talk about what we're gonna look at. So I'm gonna break down the challenge, what I call the data challenge to getting to AI into three key areas. We're gonna talk about the problem about getting access to data, what do you do with it, the curation, and then an absolutely critical piece of the puzzle is data governance. And how a lot of times people think of it as a checkpoint, but really it is a, it's a life cycle. We'll talk about some examples of where we're seeing successful deployment of AI today and talk a little bit of what it took to get there. And then I wanna dive in at the end and talk about this grand challenge of how do we get AI to help us secure our energy and smart grid infrastructure, our industrial IoT, and as we've seen in the last couple of months, the absolute need for getting better security into our energy infrastructure. So I'll start with the first challenge, which is accessing the data. How do we get to that fun AI and all the machine learning that we wanna do? Well, we need to have data. Data drives AI, data drives machine learning. And it all starts honestly with asking the right questions of your applications, but also asking our questions about the data. Where is my data and how do I get access to it? And as, as Steve mentioned earlier, there was a, a big push uh, many years ago to put everything in one place. Let's make a big data warehouse, a huge data lake, or what you almost call a data ocean, and we can get all the data in one place, then we can do some fun stuff with it. And what people saw after they tried that is that it wasn't actually a tactical problem, whether it be because of just the, the silos and the organizational boundaries to moving data between organizations, to regulations and classifications that prevented data from leaving where it was. It became very clear very quickly that they needed to have a different architecture. And so then we started looking from a big data warehouse to distributed data lakes. And that is the, really the best approach that we've seen is keeping the data somewhat where it is and bringing the compute to it. But then there was a follow on problem. Now I have my data, I've identified where it is, I've got it in the organizations, I haven't had to break it away from those data silos, I've brought my compute there, or I can do my model training on, on demand, but how do I get centralized access to the metadata? How do I get centralized access to the context? Well, then there's this newer concept that we're starting to see around data hubs, which is an extraction layer about being able to pull out some of that goodness from the data to enable model development, to enable application development, 
without having to move all the data to a central location. So one, thing, one of the key innovations we're seeing, but it's still a work in progress, is this federated approach to data management. The next stage in the process is understanding what data you have and what data you need. I think oftentimes people don't realize in organizations that they don't have all the data they need. They may need the external resources, external data sources to be able to augment the data they have, whether it be the quality of the data they already have access to or significant gaps to be able to answer those original questions. And it almost gonna come back to that fundamental thing about to do proper AI, to do proper machine learning, you need to be asking the right questions because that drives the process. It drives what data is needed to drive those engines. And something that us, uh, more advanced organizations are quickly understanding is that they have what are being labeled now these master data sets. And what they are is sort of the key data and CRM is one great example, you know, customer relation management data, uh, telemetry data. These are some of these masters which are the definition for the rest of the organization. They give you the key value pairs. They give you the, the labeling that then you can use to help standardize across the organization. Without understanding what your master data sets are, oftentimes you get lost in the shuffle of, well, wh who owns the right to call my data what? And how do I value, how do I put a key value on something if I don't know what to label it or if someone else is labeling it differently? So the master data sets is really a key tool to helping organizations sort of pick the right taxonomy for their data in order to be able to drive those high level problems around model development and creation. So step one of the, of the big challenge is getting access to the data internally and externally and making it available to each stage in the life cycle. Steve highlighted it well in one of his slides showing that it is a life cycle with multiple steps to you, before you get to the actual fun of the AI machine learning. Along those ways, getting the data architecture and data sourcing is really sort of stage one after you've asked those fundamental questions. Stage two is, we got to make the data ready for ML and AI. And that's about data curation, sometimes called data wrangling, data monitoring, data management. They've got lots of names for this architecture. But what it fundamentally comes down to, and honestly, when, I, when we've seen organizations tackle this problem, this is where they get hung up and where the lab experiments often fail is because they have terabytes of data and it's all raw data. And before you can get useful insights out of it, there needs to be some form of la labeling or conditioning or tagging that had to have occurred or needs to occur after the fact. Now, if you are lucky enough to be in an, an organization or in a place where you can apply some of that context and that metadata during the data generation, so you have advanced uh, systems, your sensors can add that context along at the time, GPS coordinates, time and date, other pieces of, of useful information, that's great. Most organizations aren't greenfield. They're starting with a, a brownfield legacy environment. And so they're dealing with senses that are just pumping out raw data. And so then ultimately it's up to somebody to go in and do the labeling and the conditioning. And when, when uh, there was a, an interesting project we worked on where they were saying, well, we'll just get a bunch of humans to go in that know the data sets and know, understand the use case and start labeling it. It was a DOD application. And the sheer volume of people that they needed to bring to bear and the time it would have taken, they never would have gotten to the outcome. So then they start looking at using what's called machine labeling and using some ML to apply labeling based on understanding where the data sets are coming from. So now you're using AI to help make your data better to get to better AI. And it sort of becomes a recursive circle. But it is an absolutely necessary and important step in the process because garbage in, garbage out. Having good data to start the process to build those models and to do that inference is what's going to drive the outcomes. And so when you're trying to get from raw data to something useful, having a mechanism or having the infrastructure in place to do data labeling and metadata and meta tagging, what we call now, you know, data conditioning is going to be crucial to getting to successful AI. I can't highlight enough how important data governance is. And what I've seen organizations fail time and again is they think of it as like they do compliance. It's a checkbox. It's a step in the, in the process. Did we pass data governance? Okay, let's move on to the next step. And that's where they fail 100% of the time because data governance isn't a compliance check. It's an overarching umbrella, if you will, of how data is managed throughout the life cycle. It applies to the data at the raw stage. It applies to the curation. It applies to the model development and it applies to the results and the outcome. 
data governments, it maybe should be called something else. It should just be called governance because really it's about governing the process, applying the rules, if you will, of how data moves through an organization, where it can go, what you can do with it, and how you drive the pipelines at the end that generate those models and then generate the outcomes. And then what you can do with those insights. When done properly, data governments can help drive and enable you to achieve the business value. But oftentimes it's, again, it's thought of, well, I need to build on some data governments at key points along the way. Successful organizations are looking at this problem as a holistic life cycle approach of data governance. And one of the key, two of the key things that they've done in order to achieve that success is one, looking at the existing controls, regulations, classifications, business rules that they have to play with and applying those into a overarching data governance um, environment. And so using what you already have and already know to help drive data governance. Step two is having data governance be part of the conversation across every stage of that life cycle. So that as you're collecting data, data governance tells you what you can and can't do with it at the earliest stages. And then it populates and almost becomes its own meta layer that flows along throughout the entire process. It means also that you need to have uh, individuals that are tasked with doing data governance for the data management organization. There's a new term that has come, a new role, if you will, called a data steward. Yes, we need data scientists, we need business analysts, we need data stewards. And a data steward's job is to manage the data governance across the life cycle and to help implement those rules at every step. One of the more innovative approaches I've seen recently is where they've taken the data governance and actually using that to drive the model pipelines. Because again, depending on the regulations you're dealing with, the outcomes and the way you use that data and what you can do with it is gonna be vastly different based on those regulations, whether it be PAI or in the case of the government, it's gonna be different classification levels. You have to have a good insight into those rules and have that help drive the data process. And so one of the biggest areas where organizations fail at the scaling of data management, AI and machine learning, is where they don't get data governance right. Even if they have all the right data, they end up getting dinged later by legal and by compliance because they didn't manage the data and manage the outcomes correctly. So let's talk about, you know, enough with the challenges part. Let's talk a bit about where we've seen some great successes. And I just, I thought about it, this AI is being used literally everywhere across the US government and the public sector. But I want to highlight on two um, because they are really vastly different in what it took to get there. So the first is computer vision for ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance kind of operations. And everyone has seen these pictures. They've seen them in the movies. You've seen them in, in newsreels. It's the using of some unmanned system, whether it be a camera, a drone, um, or on the flight, uh, on the nose cone of an aircraft, being able to take visuals, vi um, take uh, images and video and be able to do analysis in real time or in semi real time and be able to tell you, is, you know, what, what's going on at that moment with situational awareness, whether it be uh, object detection, you know, that's a tank, that's a truck, whether it be looking at from a FEMA perspective at the damage post a hurricane, all these use cases are driven by computer vision. Well, how did they get there? Much of the same way we've been talking about. They had large data sets that they needed to curate and label and then con and condition, and then had that drive model development. And the reason I picked on this one first, because we've seen computer vision be successful across every industry whether it be manufacturing, looking at sort of defect, defect uh, detection, to in the case of uh, FEMA, being able to do an after event survey for damage. All of them have used computer vision. So we've seen it as one of the most successful means of deploying AI that's really in your face. I mean, everyone's seen it with your phone, being able to take a picture and have it do facial recognition. But it's driven by the data and by the quality of that data. Now it's one thing to be able to pick out a cat you know, in a picture, but when you're able to pick up very detailed information or be able to do before and after requires a lot of data labeling. So you have to know when that data was created to be able to do that orchestration across the data pipeline. But it's also one of the areas where we've seen it widely deployed and where we see the inference or the AI models being deployed right up into the pointy edge of the spear, into the, into the drone, into, the, into the, uh, the, the plane, into the platform. The other use case, took a lot more work to get there, but we're seeing a lot bigger value. And that is around increasing operational efficiencies and supply chain, logistics, and maintenance. The DoD has actually been somewhat ahead of the curve in the application of AI and machine learning to their, over, to their operational uh, use cases. 
there was a famous example of the Air Force using machine learning and AI and applying it to their own contracts and acquisition process to get rid of redundancy, to re create efficiencies, and ultimately to be able to get faster through the process. They also found that they were, you know, they got rid of a lot of waste. And it was because they had the data and they had the, the context because it was the contract. So by net definition, the, the, the federal regulations required a certain amount of documentation. So they had a rich data set and many, many years of contracts upon which to train their models to then drive that operational efficiency. Where it's gotten to be more interesting and many of the challenges that I've just talked about have come to light is in the area of predictive maintenance and the, and the supply logistics. Being able to coordinate across different divisions, you know, supply divisions, the, the transport divisions, the actual operations that are being done and be able to make sure that the equipment is in the right place at the right time, both for what's needed at that moment, as well as predicting that you're using certain platforms and they're gonna need required maintenance out in the field. In the past, when something broke down the field, you either had to wait and ship it back to headquarters or battalion in order to get it fixed, or you left it there until somebody could show up later to come fix it. And that's just not the way to, uh, to operate in the modern world. And so what predictive maintenance and the analysis that they've done by pulling together data sets that are across division and were really multi-domain in nature, so looking at both the telemetry reports coming out of the system, the maintenance reports for prior uses, as well as weather conditions, mission operation, after action reports, and then marrying that to the supply chain logistics commands. They could have the right components in the right place in theater ready for a, a device or a system that needed repair before it actually had broken it. Just by understanding the, the wear and tear based on the environment, based on the mission, and based on the platform. And so they're already seeing in many of the, of the DOD use cases, unbelievable operation efficiencies from six months time of where an app, a platform is down to under two weeks and sometimes even a day as far as how fast they can turn around the maintenance of these systems. So these are just to highlight some really interesting examples. But with the common theme here is it all took data to drive these outcomes. So there is some, there's some amazing things you can do with AI machine learning, but the hard work is getting the data in the right place with the right labeling and with the right governance. And that really leads me to the challenge that I wanna leave you with today. The, the, the reverse pitch that I wanna give is really around how do we take the power of AI and machine learning and apply it to cybersecurity specifically in the industrial IoT, the energy and smart grid environments and the utility environments because we have every one of these challenges today. And having worked with a variety of organizations that are trying to do AI for cybersecurity, there's a common theme. They've got some, there's some great companies out there, some academic researchers and a bunch of government agencies all looking for this magical AI for cybersecurity. But the hard part isn't developing a cool model. I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of experience, but the hard part is getting the right data to drive that model. And number one problem, every single time that I've run into and that we've seen our, our partners and the companies we help support run into when it comes to cybersecurity is getting access to that data. Access to data from both IT and OT streams, getting a diverse set of data. So not just one environment, but multiple environments to really understand the diversity, especially on the OT side that is a highly diverse environment with PLCs and actuators and SCADA systems. But it's also the data quality. Oftentimes the data is not well labeled. It's many times legacy environments. And so that means we need to have a taxonomy and a mechanism to help machine learning label this data sets that are coming at us. Because we can't, once you get access data, you need to be able to make sure it's good data. And then we need to collect that data and get it in the hands of those that actually can go build those models. And one of the things that we're seeing is that those models are being developed by either small ISVs or security ISVs. They're being done in universities. They're being done by DARPA and others. And so you have all these different silos where they have maybe have a small data set that someone open sourced. So we need to figure out how do we get data into their hands? How do we get quality data labeled with the right kind of soft data? And so part of that is building the infrastructure for security information sharing. We've seen, we have things like the ISACs and other things which are information sharing, but most of the time they're focused on vulnerabilities and exploits. Something happened and then we can share what happened. We need to expand that. And the good news is the charter sort of allows for it, but we as an industry need to work together to enable 
different energy companies to share data amongst themselves, not the outcome of an event, but the, the norm, what normally goes on. Those, that data is how you train the model to be able to detect if something is anomalous. And so we need to start doing security info sharing and data set information sharing. Now, obviously this is where data governance comes in because you don't wanna just take your IT network or your OT network, scan it, and just publish that externally. So there needs to be some anonymization that goes into play, stripping out things like IP addresses, but keeping the right context so that you can accurately train the model on the AI. And this is gonna take work, but we've seen it succeed in other industries. Financial services have figured out how to get the data sets to be able to train across those organizations. We're seeing government be able to do it. The time is now, and I think in light of some of the more recent events, the time is absolutely now to take up a proactive stance of figuring out how do we, as, an, as the energy industry and the utility industry, pull together to share data sets, to share quality data, to drive models, to pick some universities, to pick some ISVs, to help enable them to build those models and then test them on our environments so that we can get the benefit of an AI to help more quickly identify anomalous behavior, anomalous activity, stop an attack before it goes deep into the environment, but also be able to, to use that data to then drive better quality and efficiency for deploying security sensors. One thing we don't wanna have is have to put antivirus on every sensor, every PLC and every turbine. That's also an intractable problem. But having an oversight AI that can monitor the network and monitor those systems is really sort of the approach that's gonna allow us to apply security to these OT very highly reliable and highly fragile environments without interfering with them. And so I think this is one of the grand challenges we should be looking at is how do we enable AI for cybersecurity by solving these data challenges to be able to get to the really cool AIs that we are looking for to help solve these security problems. So with that, I'd like to thank you and uh, again, turn it back over to Hannah for Q&A. Okay, it looks like Steve um, Centrum is having a little bit of audio issues. So we are gonna go to Steve Oren here. Steve, thank you for your great presentation. That was awesome. Um, a few questions for you. Uh, what are some of the best solutions and successes you've seen for managing maintenance at utilities and logistics? So I think um, one way to think about the problem about managing uh, logistics is, again, it goes back to uh, those that have figured out how to manage their data that drives that predictive maintenance. Um, so the, the couple examples that we've seen have been really driven by, um, and again, in the early phases, they've been driven by sort of two approaches. One is what I call the open source do-it-yourself, where they have used things like Amazon and some and Cassandra and Spark and, and uh, Airflow and others to build out a pipeline and build out that infrastructure to drive predictive maintenance. Again, the successful ones have understood that it's a multi-domain problem. And then the other ones, honestly, that we've seen been very successful is ones that have used like C3AI and similar approaches to take a more holistic approach from a commercial product and sort of buy all in into an environment and have them help drive those connectors, if you will, to the different data sets and the different uh, uh, model-driven approaches. So I've seen success in both cases. Really, it comes down to the expertise you in, have in-house and the, uh, the data set you have in-house. Organizations that have a small team of, of, of data scientists and capability are often better augmented by a commercial company that has you know, a large team of people that can augment and can build those uh, environments for you. Those that have a, a larger uh, capability internally of development, especially uh, technical driven organizations that have access to developers or have been doing a lot of development themselves often feel more comfortable taking more active role in building out that predictive maintenance system. In the government space, I've seen sort of um, it start one way, like, oh, we're going to go open source because the government's going to do everything open source. And then they shift over to the uh, to the commercial solution when they realize that the turnover problem. And that's something that we see in government. We also see it in certain other industries, financial services and tech, is that you get a bunch of highly trained people and then they go someplace else. And now you're left holding the bag and you have to retrain. And so the commercial approach really works for organizations that either have small teams or they have high turnover uh, for those really uh, technical teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, I think Steve Sundstrom is still working on some things. So Steve Oren, I'm gonna keep going with you. 
Um, sure. How much lead time have you found is needed for the pre-work and data management to getting utilities ready for AI solution deployment? So that's a great question. And um, most of my experience is going to be with uh, federal and public sector use cases. There are a couple of utilities I've worked with. Um, I think, and actually I'm going to use the slide from Steve's uh, presentation so that six quarter approach is probably a good metric. I've seen some do it a little bit quicker, but I want to be clear, this is for this operational scale. You can do a lab project fairly quickly. I've actually got, we've done some really cool lab projects in three to six months to be able to get some outcome and some value. But to really operationalize it, you're talking about um, a year and a half minimum to sort of get that to scale. And I think that's the key thing that people often forget is we can do a lot of really cool stuff in a small pilot and in a lab environment. You can control the sort of how many different nodes you're dealing with and the amount of data sets. But if you to do the proper planning to scale to the site to a large organization takes it. The work is not the code. I mean, in Steve's show, there's lots of code to be done. The work is the planning. The getting the right people in the room to define the governance, to make to break down data silos, to deploy that architecture. And that does take time. And so from soup to nuts, I think that that six quarter uh, metric that Steve showed in slides probably a really good average. Again, some organizations will be faster. Definitely have seen some slower there. I won't pick on any particular agency, but there are some agencies that are still five years you know, in from when they said, we want to do AI to having it operationally scale. So, but I think the six quarters are really a good, you know, that 18 month window is really a good, uh, a good metric for that. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Okay. We're going to give you just a little bit of a break here. We have got Steve Sundstrom back and ready to go. So Steve, um, to start with you, what's the next big solution on the horizon for C3 for electric utilities? Uh, great question. And I heard your question earlier. We do work with EPRI, so let me answer that. Um, secondly, uh, that I, boy, that is a great question. And, and I will say, I will, I will answer that one this way. Remember, it wasn't long ago that, uh, you, we in utilities referred to our customers as rate payers. Uh, again, this was not long ago. What I am particularly excited about is the idea that we can leverage a whole new range of AI applications to engage with utility customers in the same way that, uh, customers interface with their banks, their travel companies, with Netflix, with Amazon, much more customer friendly way, much more proactive uh, and much more uh, engaging. I was really captivated by the panel by LADWP yesterday about their zero carbon goals for 2035, which is right around the corner. And what I heard was they're going to require a lot of participation and engagement with their customers in order to achieve that. So I'm imagining Again, a, a whole new kind of AI CRM capability that utilities will be implementing to interact nimbly and proactively with their customers in the near term. This is very exciting to me. That's great, great. Okay, well, it looks like we are at 10 o'clock Eastern on the dot. Thank you both so much for a great keynote. Way to uh, start day three strong. I'm really excited for the rest of our day. We will be back here at 1030 Eastern time um, for our first response to a reverse pitch. So thank you again to Steve and Steve. Uh, for the rest of the audience, we will see you back here at 1030 Eastern. Thank you very much.